Welcome back to Duke's Social Science Research Institute's module on network visualization. We're going to discuss a little bit some diagnostics and some general questions that we should have in mind when doing network visualization. Network visualization is a storytelling process and that's, we want that story to line up with our general research question and to help us get more traction with that research question. So when we're coming into a network's uh, perspective and we want to apply a network's perspective to understanding a research question, there's generally two broad approaches that are used. One is to consider networks as a kind of variable in, for instance, a classic regression uh, framework where the, say it's an individual, has particular network features that make them different from other individuals in the data set. And then uh, this is a feature that then can predict some kind of outcome variable. So for example, um, imagine you're interested in deviant behaviors in schools and you want to know, well, does being isolated in a school, does that help contribute to a student's likelihood of engaging in a delinquent behavior, right? The other major approach when looking at networks as a way of getting traction on network question is to actually think of networks as structures in themselves that have causal properties. Both approaches leverage two major kinds of features that networks have. So they, meet, they um, leverage connectionist features, basically how the networks are wired, and positional features, so unique positions that the nodes occupy that might give us some ideas about the underlying mechanisms that are informing the network and informing our outcome. Okay, so diving into these connectionist features, and again, this is just to give you sort of a framework about thinking about I have a network, or well, how am I leveraging, how am I getting the most out of it? And I'm going to give you sort of a set of initial features to think about that then we may want to um, emphasize in any visualizations or subsequent analyses. Again, to review, what is connectionist features? It's features that emerge from the way that the network is wired. And the first kind of measure that we'd like to do is get a sense of density, the network's density. And what the network's density is, is the proportion of connected ties over the total possible connections in the network. So how connected is this network? You can imagine networks that are highly connected are places where information can transfer easily, diseases can transfer easily. But most networks, and particularly most social networks, aren't uniformly connected. So while density can give us a first measure of the degree of connection in the network, there are additional measures that we want to look at to get a sense about how things are moving through that network. And those features are average path length, transitivity, clustering, and the degree distribution of the network. And we're going to talk about each one of those one at a time. So average path length. Well, first of all, what's a path? Um, imagine that you're a vertice and you want to go all the way through that network. A path is essentially a closed loop where no vertice repeats and no edge repeats. And average path length is the average number of shortest paths to get around that network. And so what average path length gives us is a sense about how efficiently is information moving through that network. Well, average path length can be correlated with density. They're not um, a one-for-one -one thing because, for instance, you can have high average path length but a low density. And in a case like that is imagine a world where you have a few very highly connected nodes and everyone else just plugs into them. So imagine in your mind a star, for instance, or a couple of stars connected to each other. So you have these highly central nodes, and lots of connections are going into them, they're connected to one another, and so that could be a super efficient network, and oftentimes we actually find um, networks where there's high cost of maintaining those ties, like networks between businesses, for instance, that they will have this low average path length, so it doesn't take very many steps to get through that network. But they're not particularly dense because they're actually trying to minimize the number of connections that they have to maintain. So average path length gives us a sense of just how efficiently is this network being wired. So we're going down this length, we got 
how connected is the network. We've got how efficiently connected is the network. The next connectionist related question is uh, related to a concept con called transitivity. And what transitivity is, is imagine that I'm friends with Jim. Jim's filming me, by the way, so I hope we're friends. And say Jim and I have a third friend. Now, if a network's highly transitive, then Jim and I are also going to be friends with that third friend, with this, with this alter that we share. And we're going to form what's called a closed triad. And in networks with lower transitivity, that might not be necessarily the case. We might, we might be friends, but we, know, we mutually know this third person, we're friends with them, but we're not all friends with each other. So transitivity is important because it can give us an idea of some potential underlying mechanisms in the network. So for instance, we see high transitivity when there's mutuality, where there's a win-win situation, as, it, as we say, where there may be shared costs. So for instance, the mafia, the mafia has high transitivity because uh, I know you, you know me, we all know each other, and um, if anything goes awry, we know who to punish, right? Or we have a common enemy or threat. So an enemy of an enemy, we're friends. We have a common enemy, we'll be connected together. We're all connected, but we may be banding together uh, in response to a common threat. Or there may be social sanctioning. So for instance, in societies where there is an institution for instance, um, say the Catholic Church 50 years ago. If you wanted to be married, you're going to have a nice Catholic marriage. We're all going to be joined together. That would have high transitivity because essentially um, I can't be connected to you without being also connected to other people. So if I'm marrying into a family, if that's a healthy family, I hope I'm also connected to, say, my father and mother-in-law, and those are positive ties, right? So those, th that transitivity observed in the network, that's not just an accidental feature. There's a social mechanism that's enforcing that transitivity that we could observe. And that social mechanism might be interesting.